studies showed is that a very simple single mutation, this was in Drosophila, the fruit fly that we use for lots of laboratory studies, but a single mutation could separate two species so they could no longer interbreed. That was remarkable because prior to that, people thought, as I showed in one of my slides, that this might take years or even decades. We now know that in certain cases it can happen in a single generation. So yes, I think there will continue to be breakthroughs. We continue to find new fossils. A spectacular new fossil was found in Africa just last week or reported just last week. And finally, evolution is the tool that we use to investigate our genome. In other words, the exploration of the human genome, the DNA sequences that make us human, that exploration wouldn't be possible without using evolution as a tool to compare ourselves to closely related and distantly related organisms to see where natural selection has happened on us. And every time we do that, we find new things out. So I'm confident that new breakthroughs are going to continue to happen. I should see, I should take, should have brought a bag with a whole bunch of these. Sir, right in the center, blue shirt, yeah. Um, so, because of these mutations, people change. So, do we have actually a method of predicting as to when these possible mutations will take place? Well, one of the fun things, if you want to call about, about that, about uh, mutation and genetic change, is that it is to an extent unpredictable. In other words, you simply don't know um, where errors or mistakes or duplications or translocations of DNA are going to pop up. So, in that sense, we don't really know. However, Sean Carroll, one of the people who gave the, the, earlier, uh, the earlier lectures in the evolution series, pointed out that we animals actually have a genetic makeup that builds the body. In other words, that produces top, bottom, belly, back, head, tail, limbs, segments within our body, which we can actually see in blocks of muscle and blocks of bone and so forth. And the genetic makeup that produces that body, he argues, is actually almost predisposed to produce useful variation. So even though we don't know where the genetic change is going to pop up, the genetic makeup of organisms around today is actually geared to accept that and to produce useful variation. Now one of the things that evolution does, and this is a technical term, is it explores adaptive space. Now what that means in a jargon sense is that organisms basically reach out in one direction or another and it's natural selection that fine-tunes that variation and finds the solution. So if we start to use new antibiotics in our hospital, we can be certain that the bacteria we're trying to kill are going to evolve resistance to those antibiotics. We don't know where the mutations will come from. We don't know when, but we can be certain because we're creating a form of natural selection that that can happen. And we see this kind of change all the time. So to that extent, it's somewhat predictable. Okay? Thank you. Right in the center. Yeah. Do you believe in eugenics? Um, well, uh, eugenics is a word that was coined, actually, I think by Francis Galton, who was the nephew of Charles Darwin. And it, is, it generally is understood as describing the process of using genetics to improve our own species. And the answer to that is, no, I don't. Because, first of all, I think it's naive to believe that we can look at you or me or Dennis or anybody else and say, you know, um, you're not worth reproducing. We don't like your genes. We're, we're going to let you have a lot of children, or we're going to try to do this sort of thing. For two reasons. One is it's inhumane. It doesn't respect the individual dignity that we all have as human beings. And secondly, it overstates dramatically the extent of scientific knowledge. We don't know that much about human genetics that we can actually say how we can breed or make or otherwise manipulate a better human being. Now, to having said that I don't believe in eugenics, because that's the way it's usually understood, I do believe that modern genetics and genomics give individuals the pr information that they need to make decisions about their own reproductive future. And I'll give you a perfect example of a eugenics-like program that I think has worked extremely well. There is a serious inherited genetic disorder among, in this country among Jewish people of a certain ancestry called Tay-Sachs disease. It's a recessive disorder. It's extremely rare. If a baby is born who carries two copies of Tay-Sachs, what happens is their nervous system breaks down. It breaks down dramatically between the second and third year of life. They usually die before they're old enough to go to kindergarten. It's very difficult for the family. It's extremely traumatic. So what has been operating within the Jewish community for quite a few years has been a program to encourage people who are about to get married 
to voluntarily get tested to see if they carry one copy of this gene. Because if they are then about to marry somebody who carries another copy of it, geneticists can tell them they have a one in four chance of producing a child with Tay-Sachs. Now, they may take that information and decide they're going to they're gonna try anyway. Or they may take that information and decide, tell you what, let's adopt children. Or let's otherwise undergo reproductive interventions that will ensure that we don't bring a child into the world with this horrible disease. But that kind of decision making, I would say, is not eugenics. That kind of decision making is basically giving people the information that they need to make informed decisions about their own lives, and I think that's a good thing. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to move things around. Sir. When do you think that there's going to be evidence of abiogenesis? Oh, when do I think there's going to be evidence of abiogenesis? Abiogenesis is a term that means life coming from inanimate matter. Well, it um, depends what you mean by that. Um, some people would say that abiogenesis took place about 10 years ago. Um, and it was 10 years ago, uh, a little more than 10 years ago, I think, when scientists took chemicals off the shelf, put them into DNA synthesizers, synthesized the DNA molecule of a virus, and then were able to reconstruct a virus particle. So if you consider viruses to be living, that's abiogenesis. Um, a very well-known scientist, Craig Ventner, who worked on the Human Genome Project, is now trying to do exactly the same thing with a real cell, not a virus, a bacterium, trying to construct a medical, uh, minimal organism. Knowing this guy, within a few years, he's probably going to succeed. So that sort of ability to take non-living chemicals and put them uh, and make them come alive by mimicking the living cell, I think that's pretty close. The larger question that I think you're asking is how soon is it going to be that we will have an answer to the riddle of how the first living cell originated from non-living chemicals on this planet. Um, I'm not optimistic that it's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, and the reason for that is it happened a long time ago, and it didn't leave much evidence. But there are a number of researchers who have put together pieces of the puzzle. And I'm certainly confident that that's exactly how it took place. Jack Shostak at Harvard has done some absolutely brilliant work that involves self-replicating RNA molecules and the number of the simulations of conditions on the primitive Earth. So I certainly think that it happened that way. But in terms of achieving a total understanding, I think we're a couple of decades away from really understanding how life originated on this Earth. Good question. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.